All right, here we are. This is the third lecture of chapter six. It's all about early imperial Rome. Had we done this in class, it would have been two separate lectures, but that's because there would have been a lot of group work and discussion groups for both of these lectures. So instead, I'll just move that to the lecture questions and discussion questions. We are gonna be discussing mostly architecture today but we'll do a combination of domestic architecture and public. And we will also discuss how they decorated their architecture and how styles changed over time. We'll begin with a wide view and then we'll zoom in. So like Etruscan towns, Roman towns were designed as a grid with two bisecting main streets that crossed at right angles, and then it would divide the layout into quarters. And the forum and other public buildings were generally located at this intersection. We'll begin in Pompeii, the housing in the Roman city consisted of brick apartment blocks called insulae. These apartment buildings had internal courtyards, multiple floors joined by narrow staircases, and occasionally overhanging balconies. Temples and government buildings surrounded a main square. Shops and houses lined mostly straight paved streets, and a protective wall enclosed the heart of the city. The Forum was the center of civic life in Roman cities, just like the Agora was the center of civic life in Greek cities. Apart from the insulae, wealthy city dwellers lived in private houses with enclosed gardens, and these houses were often fronted by shops facing the street. Wealthy Romans seemed to care less about the exterior and they emphasized the interior of these homes. People would enter the house from the street through a vestibule or opening or door, and they would step into the atrium, which was a large space with an impluvium or a pool for catching rainwater. The peristyle was a courtyard with a garden that was farther into the house and enclosed by columns. Off the peristyle was the formal reception room and an office called the tablinum. And this tablinum is where the head of household would meet with clients. And then those portrait busts that we talked about in the Roman Republic of the family would be displayed in either the tablinum or the atrium. The mild southern climate of Italy permitted gardens to flourish year-round, so the peristyle was often turned into an outdoor living room with painted walls, fountains, and sculpture. As you can see in this mid-1st century CE remodeling of the 2nd century BC House of the Vettii, which is the house we will focus on. You can see from this plan that when you enter the house, you can look through the large atrium and view that rear garden that's surrounded by the large peristyle. And then, unique to this house, there was not a tablinum, so they must have conducted their business in other rooms. The main reason to focus on the House of the Vettii is that it contains some of the best preserved wall paintings of the time. This is called the Ixion Room, and the pictures resemble framed panel paintings and then Swags of garland are painted above the marble dado, which is that lower wall decoration. The three-dimensionality is enhanced by use of linear perspective and volumetric figures. But before we get to dissecting this room more, we need to talk about how Roman painting evolved. And it evolved over the course of about 300 years and in four distinctive styles. Style number one is also known as incrustation, and this is BCE, so about 200 to 60 BCE. This consists of the wall containing colorful patches of block that resembled marble. The marble-like look was acquired by the use of stucco moldings, which caused portions of the wall to appear as if they were raised. Wealthy Romans used costly imported marbles in a variety of colors to decorate their walls. Ordinary Romans could not afford such an expense, so they decorated their homes with painted imitations of the luxurious yellow, purple, and pink marbles that the wealthy Romans would use. Style number two overlaps a bit with style number one. It's called architectural, and it incorporated aspects from the first style, such as the marble blocks. The marble blocks were typically lined along the base of the wall, and the actual picture was created on flat plaster. So you can see that there are images on these walls. Many paintings from this style involved illusions of imaginary scenes. And while encrustation embraced the flatness of the wall, the second style attempted to trick the viewer. Painters wanted to give off the illusion that the viewer was looking through a window at the scenery depicted. 
They also added objects that are commonly seen in real life, such as vases and shelves, along with items that appeared to be sticking out of the wall. This style was intended for viewers to feel as though the actions in the painting were taking place around them. In this painting, the artist utilizes multiple vanishing points. This technique shifts the perspective throughout the room, from balconies to fountains and along colonnades into the far distance. But the visitor's eye moves continuously throughout the room, barely able to register that he or she has remained contained within a small room. The third style, known as ornamental, while sort of similar to the first style in its wide, flat planes of color, is actually based on the second style. Painters made use of the flat surfaces of the wall, and they could be divided into different sections or frames, with each section painted a different color. In this particular style, more wall space is left plainly colored with no design, and when designs were present, they tended to be small, plain pictures or scenes such as a candelabra or fluted appendages. Black, red, and yellow continued to be used throughout this period, but the use of green and blue became more prominent than in previous styles. The third style also saw the introduction of Egyptian themes and imagery, including scenes of the Nile as well as Egyptian deities and motifs. Possibly because in 30 BCE, Egypt became a Roman province and this strange culture became intriguing to many Romans. Most of these paintings had very little extra designs added to them, so many critics, including Vitruvius, claimed that they had no meaning. Painters, however, that used this technique found it easy to change the paintings due to the lack of design. Also, an added convenience was that only a portion of the wall could be changed instead of repainting the entire wall. And that brings us to our fourth style, which is intricate. And this goes from 20 CE to 79 CE. And there is a very specific reason for that date, which I will get to in a minute. This is best known as a combination of the three previous styles using the blocks from the first style, architectural scenes from the second style, and large patches of color from the third style. Instead of directly using the aspects from the previous styles, though, the intricate style added a new spin to each that we've seen so far. Intricate paintings appeared busier and used the wall in its entirety to be complete. Large central panels were used to display an actual picture, like a painted picture. There would be a combination of themes that were painted in these pictures, including mythology, landscape, or other images. This is from the House of the Vetii, the Ixion room that we talked about earlier. It contains examples of the fourth style and can still be found in Pompeii today. This is an example of a central panel painting, and basically the reason the room is called the Ixion Room. Ixion, who was the Lapith king, we talked about the Lapiths before in the Metopes in the Parthenon. He is being punished for betraying Zeus because he was lusting after his wife. Ixion attempted to seduce her, so Zeus created the cloud goddess Nephili in the image of Hera. Ixion lays with Nephili, and their union creates the centaurs. As punishment, Zeus banishes Ixion from Olympus and orders Hermes to tie Ixion to a winged, fiery wheel, which is to spin for eternity. In this scene, Ixion is bound to the wheel, and Hermes stands in the forefront, identifiable by his winged sandals and caduceus. Hephaestus stands behind the wheel, one hand resting on the wheel to set it in motion. Hermes, however, also has one hand on the wheel, keeping it still as he looks to Hera. Maybe he's sympathetic to the plight of Ixion. Hera is enthroned to the right, holding a long golden scepter and wearing a golden crown, and beside her is her messenger, Iris, extending her arm to present to Hera Ixion's punishment. Hera pulls aside her thin veil to watch the scene. A young woman sits next to Hermes with one hand up. This might be Ixion's mother or the cloud goddess Nephili. Okay, so now let's address why the style stopped in 79 CE. So in the first century, the Roman Empire contained many cities, especially those in the beautiful setting that lined the Bay of Naples. On the 24th of August, 79 CE, volcanic ash spewed from Mount Vesuvius. Pompeii in nearby Herculaneum disappeared from the face of the earth. Gradually, grass and vines covered the land where the town stood and the local people eventually forgot even the names of the buried towns. Along with Herculaneum, Pompeii was partially destroyed and buried under 13 to 20 feet of ash and pumice in the eruption, and it was lost for nearly 1,700 years before its accidental rediscovery in 1749. The heat was the main cause of the death of people. 
It previously was believed they died from ash suffocation. Herculaneum was actually accidentally rediscovered in 1738 by workmen who were digging for the foundations of a summer palace for the king of Naples, Charles of Bourbon. Pompeii was rediscovered as the result of intentional excavation in 1748. This rediscovery of these towns actually provided inspiration for neoclassicism, which was a style that was popular 1700 years after the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. Okay, we're going to move out of domestic and more into public slash domestic architecture. We will start with Nero, who reigned from 54 to 68 CE, and he actually started out okay, but he quickly became intoxicated with power. He was fond of giving concerts, and during the Great Fire of Rome in 64 CE, he was giving a recital of the Sack of Troy, and he did not stop the performance to try and assist with the fire, hence the term fiddling while Rome burns. In the same spot where the fire destroyed a large swath of the city, he built a ridiculously large and expensive house. Some scholars even believe he set the fire on purpose to build his pleasure palace. It was called the Domus Aurea, and it extended from the Palatine Hill to the Esquiline Hill. The vestibule, or receiving hall, was over a mile long, with a bronze colossus of himself at over 120 feet tall. In 68 CE, Nero killed himself, sort of. And that ended the Julio-Claudian dynasty. And then eventually Vespasian seized control of the government in 69 CE, and he founded a new dynasty known as the Flavian dynasty. And they did a few things to get back on track. The first thing is they replaced the Julio-Claudian fashion for classicizing imperial portraiture with their return to the ideal of time-worn faces. They were moderate, reasonable, and successful emperors. Vespasian built the Flavian Amphitheater, which we will talk about shortly, commonly called the Colosseum because it stood next to the colossal statue of Nero that originally stood outside the Domus Aurea that you would have seen in that map that I put up earlier. Titus captured Jerusalem in 70 CE and sacked the Temple of Solomon, carrying off its contents, and that was commemorated in his triumphal arch. When Domitian, son of Vespasian and brother of Titus, assumed the throne in 81 CE, he commissioned a triumphal arch to honor the capture of Jerusalem by his deified brother. It is constructed of concrete and it was faced with marble. It's basically a freestanding gateway with a passage covered by a barrel vault. It's part architecture and part sculpture. These freestanding triumphal arches commemorate a triumph or a formal victory celebration, during which a victorious general or emperor would parade through Rome, through these arches, with his troops, captives, and booty. On this specific arch, there are spandrels on the upper left and right of the arch that contain personifications of victory as winged women. The soffit, or the underside of the archway, is deeply coffered with the relief of the apotheosis which basically means a scene that glorifies or deifies someone. This is the apotheosis of Titus at the center. The interior also contains two panels commemorating the joint triumph celebrated by Titus and his father Vespasian in the summer of 71. This is a closer look at the apotheosis, and basically it just means a transformation from mortal to divine. And it was the ultimate goal for many Roman emperors and required the recognition of the Senate. An emperor's triumph, or a ceremony to publicly celebrate the military or diplomatic victory of a commander, was also awarded by the Senate, and it was seen as the first step to earning apotheosis. This relief, interestingly, is most legible when the viewer is walking away from the forum as one would during an imperial funeral. And if you see it this way, the images connect the ideas of military victory, triumph, and divinity. As I mentioned previously, this arch was to celebrate the triumph in Jerusalem, and one of the relief sculptures on the inside of the Arch of Titus depicts Titus's soldiers flaunting the booty, in this case a large menorah, uh, by looting the Jewish peoples. There are varying depths in the sculpture, and it kind of creates the impression that the looters are moving toward the viewer. The soldiers head toward the right through the arch. It's turned to project into our space. 
thus connecting us to the chaos and looting that we will now be enjoying as Romans. I'm sure you're all familiar with this. This is the Colosseum that was started by Vespasian and completed by Ascentitis in another attempt to bring a sense of goodwill between ruler and the ruled after that nightmare of Nero. The Colosseum was built to house spectators for animal hunts, performances, and fights to the death. Arena, the floor, basically means sand, was there to absorb all of the blood that would be shed. The outer wall is estimated to have over 100,000 cubic meters of travertine stone, which was set without mortar. It suffered extensive damage over the centuries, with large segments having collapsed after earthquakes. There were three stories of superimposed arcades. The arcades are framed by half columns of the Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian orders. There's 240 massed corbels, and they were positioned around the top of the attic. Those are those sticks. They originally supported a retractable awning known as the Valerium that kept the sun and rain off of spectators. It was a canvas-covered net-like structure that was made of ropes with a hole in the center, and it covered two-thirds of the arena, and it sloped down towards the center to catch the wind and provide a breeze for the audience. Sailors who were housed in a nearby city were used to work the Valerium, because, of course, their experience with working sails on ships. I'm sure, as you've already guessed, the Colosseum is named for the colossal statue of Nero that once stood nearby. The statue was later remodeled by his successors into the likeness of Apollo, or Helios, the sun god. Also, his head was replaced several times with the heads of succeeding emperors. The other thing is that this is built where Nero's artificial lake once was, so it transformed something that was a symbol of greed and excess and privilege, because only Nero had access to it, into something that would bring entertainment to the masses. The fact that it was built on top of the lake gave other opportunities to this site, like mock sea battles or reenactments of famous battles. Under Domitian, who we talked about earlier, younger brother of Titus and son of Vespasian, he constructed the Hypogeum, which was a series of underground tunnels used to house animals and slaves. And animal hunts continued in the Colosseum until around 523 CE. In order to create that Hypogeum, the Romans needed to create a structure that was strong, that would support things above it, and also allow for quick movement. And these tunnels were made basically as extensions of arches. And again, the Romans didn't invent the arch, but they perfected the use of it. And they became experts in covering large open architectural spaces with concrete and masonry, and they used different kinds of archways. Barrel vaults, groin vaults, and even domes are a version of an arch. All right, let's leave it there. I'll talk to you again soon. <laughs>